So here we are, um, two visions with photography. Um, it was really, fun. yes, it's uh, been very well put together by ourselves and the gallery. Um, and it came about when we were invited by the gallery to to um, put on the first photographic based show. Deal Beach Echoes series um, where I was looking to use the abstract qualities that you get with the monochrome or black and white photograph to really display the, the shapes and situations that are evident on this beach due to the way of the fishermen and their equipment and paraphernalia affect what is going on on a day-to-day -day basis from so over here you've got <coughs> what's left of nets and bits of uh, lobster pots and bits of high tension wire that they used to move the boats up and down a very steep shingle beach um, to facing the other direction where you've got what seems to be some hideous monstrous contraption hidden behind uh, an old tarpaulin with a, a cut through hole by some demonic skipper with a big lever coming up here that when the lever is pulled could uh, open a trajectory into the sea but actually it doesn't obviously um, <clears throat> it's used to winch the boats up and down the beach Behind that is a very busy path, and there are cyclists, uh, dog walkers, then the bandstand and the green, and the various 18th century buildings behind. Um, and the fact is that the black and white gives it uh, uh, that quality of timelessness. Is that, is that what the black and white was? Yes, yeah, specifically, if you get that timeless quality, is it 1965, is it 1995? No, it's 2015. But also, yes, that inherent mystery again of something that's just a shape wrapped up and behind you have the pier. Um, <clears throat> so it conjures up all sorts of, especially again in black and white, um, kind of ideas of what that could be. And then the almost nice uh, bit of picket wooden fence in the foreground. And then over here you have uh, what is obviously a stormy sky um, and dusk has long been and um, just the remains of these coiled ropes in the foreground and again it's left ready to go back out to sea having returned. So the shooting method was always at dusk to darkness using external flashlight um, so the flashlight would, is, was not your normal camera it would be quite a powerful uh, hammerhead system off camera sometimes um, and again here to to pick out the detail of, of these wooden jetties and this winch where it's going out to this what looks like a beached you know, baby whale um, <clears throat> and again but then you've got this you know the darkness that it came from um, and in in the back all this wonderful moving charging horses all, all clouds so again, it's very evocative of, of, the air, of, of the whole scenario of sea, man, the elements. The working beach. Um, but really looking at the amazing colours of the paraphernalia or equipment that is involved in the fishing trade and how everything has to be a bright... Um, primary colour or near enough so that it stands out in the distance mm. and that when you see them en masse on the beach themselves uh, they present themselves as natural sculptural arrangements or objects and then they have these brilliant colours so it was really about capturing that uh, again using flashlight but the flashlight is, can be used quite subtly for instance in this top one uh, this boat here just to really bring out the shape and form 
and it's quite kind of delicate softness with this tempestuous uh, uh, raging cloud shapes behind. Um, but they have, it has a very serene, still quality about it. Um, purposely giving that sort of bluish midnight sky, but sort of uh, the time of year was probably more autumn. So it wasn't as dark as it would have been in, for instance, a winter sky. Um, <coughs> again, here <coughs> using these uh, wonderful blue containers and how that blue is continued into the sea and into the, again, tempestuous cloud form. And here you have the arrangement of lobster pots and the colours of the, of, of the ropes and the boat, which is uh, half hidden, but there, but blacked out. Um, and, you know, again, becomes another shape against that dark, forbidding sea. And yet the, the actual shingle of the beach is at that light level is quite gold and shimmering. The, the substrate or the, or the background image, yeah. which um, because obviously f uh, I have a big passion for the countryside since growing up. Um, but the fact when you photograph it, in a black and white way, it becomes again timeless, and you introduce lots of abstract qualities into the the tonalities of of trees, leaves, rocks, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, for instance, this one here uh, is a watercolor painting. This one here is it's it's just yeah. So it's like a background layer, and then in 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 for instance software, certain software which I won't mention. Um, it's the colours are manipulated. So, for instance, in this one, I'm using the, the idea of having repeating black and white um, uh, characters who are obviously related. But the fact that they're black and white gives it a whole different dynamic that they're almost blended into the landscape. Whereas this character here is obviously almost um, jumping out of the landscape. In its in its uh, coloration, a bit like you know the, those amphibious, uh, I mean those fr those Amazon jungle you know uh, uh, creatures which are highly coloured, you know. Um, so it leaves it very open to the to the imagination, um, but it adds a different dimension to the way they blend into the backdrop, and purposely they are rendered so that the uh, they're not absolutely thick. Um, that you can see the forest through them, behind them. I made the, the, the photographs from things I particularly like, a collection of tools, yeah. over many years. And seeing a, <clears throat> a group of poor clay, it immediately made me feel that the tools and the portraiture of Paul Clay came together. Yeah. And when I started printing, the Paul Clay kind of interest of what he had done in the abstract came into my looking and making the print of the tools. So I've called it a homage to Paul Clay. I was interested in the sort of um, surface, uh, the way the light picked up edges, almost Rembrandt-esque, how there is a focus of light that's, um, that I was able to use yeah. in the dark room. Now, the dark room is where you almost draw the image. So you're, you can do so many things in the dark room with this sort of print. And it enabled me to kind of redraw and form the um, imagery. And more and more, Paul Clay seemed to guide me.
Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Um, <clears throat> Prospero was the magician from the Tempest. Um, and the technique was to find certain uh, rivers that are, um, have an overhang of trees where the light will come through in uh, dappled formations across the moving water. Um, so not just any open river, it's uh, specifically sourced, I should say, or found rivers. But also in addition to the, the lighting technique, it was again using the uh, flash, additional flashlights, so that the flashlight would light up the water in, in giving different highlights. So it all, 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 uh, kind of lift it out of just being a water surface. It would almost make a, you know, dare I say, a painting surface with all the movements um, and the coloration that the, the external flashlight would give along with the natural light. Um, these two works here are um, from uh, a series of works which came out of uh, influences from being and living in America where I uh, drove from the east coast to the west coast. Um, images that I found in the landscape and particularly this one here where I was using um, an image from Deal Beach, believe it or not, uh, which is the right, po right hand portion. Um, and these two uh, film noir images from the 1940s. And, and after the print was made, um, I wanted to extend that, that movement and interplay um, with actually using enamel gloss paint mm. in black and white form and see what it did. Um, and applying it in such a way that kind of had a relationship with the way that the chemicals had worked when the print was made. looking at the garden <clears throat> many years ago, probably in the 90s. And at that time, though I was uh, still teaching, I was using the camera with students. Yeah. And I loved, um, my, my, my first interest were the tulips, which I like. And the tulips became, I became obsessed with the way they were growing from the sort of green tight head to the open head. Um, again, forming a sort of portrait as I see it. Yeah, definitely. And that went on for a number of years. <clears throat> Wherever I was, um, sometimes in the countryside, the wing fern became a very interesting plant to observe. So seeing, to me, was creative yeah. at that time. Do you have any, any thoughts on the, on the comparison between photography and painting? Because obviously you've done both and taught and stuff. <coughs> um, they're both, to me, useful media. Yeah. Um, almost to the point of what I can't at, the, at certain times, what I can't paint, I photograph. Yeah. And what I can't photograph, I can paint. Uh, a lot of my recent sea paintings, paintings of movement and water, um, really has taken time for me to find the right kind of language. Mm. But I should pursue both. I, uh, I still use the, the, the camera and I use a notebook, a sketchbook in the traditional sense. You always carry one with you? Yes, I do. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs>